Hello, and welcome to this NJCU Center for the Arts digital event. We would like to ask everyone to please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the program, and we will only be accepting questions and comments via the chat window. At the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, or possibly the top right if you are on a different device, you should be able to see an option for chat. If you click that, it will open the chat window where you can type your questions so that they may be read aloud and answered. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Please note, the views and opinions expressed in this virtual event and presentation are solely those of the individual artists in their personal capacity and are not reflective of nor represent official policy, position, or views of New Jersey City University. Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Stephanie Chaikin. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts at NJCU. And I'd like to welcome you to the 12th annual Wonder Women Residency. Um, you're in for an amazing treat today. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Doris Casualo, who is the founder of this residency. Um, she is NJCU's Interim Associate Gallery, Gallery Director. Doris is an artist, activist, curator and educator. She has an MFA in Integrated Media Arts from Hunter College, and she's been teaching at Hunter College, Rutgers University, and New Jersey City University. Doris is co-founding director of GAIA, an artist collective working to help support women artists and the advocacy of women's issues established in 2002, and she has curated group artist exhibitions showcasing the work of over 400 artists. Doris is the founder and curator of this Wonder Women Residency Program, which is an annual group artist residency and exhibition. Her work also includes interactive sculpture, community-based performance, online digital installations, printmaking, ceramic, and fiber arts. So we're so glad that you brought this to our season, Doris, and I'm gonna turn this over to you to tell us about the day. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Stephanie Chicken, and to your team at Center for the Arts. It's such a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, so a little bit about the project. The 12th annual Wonder Women Residency is the first uh, to be held entirely online. The residency in the past has tackled other themes, including war, religion, immigration, money, and education, sort of just these, these really big, broad sweeping themes. This year with the global pandemic surging and everything uh, sort of upside down, uh, the theme of the residency this year, health, was chosen to meet the artists, myself included, where we found ourselves in this global pandemic at home, mostly alone or in, in isolation in part. And so the residency, which began in January of 2021, discusses the many ways that we uh, attempted or attempted to discuss and analyze health, creative practice um, in sort of a, a broader context. Uh, uh, field of themes, which is approaching health through food, thinking about meditation, joy, relationships, genetics and disease, healthcare, uh, mental health, uh, medicine, and what is what is counted as medicine, culture, family, history, and ultimately technology. And, and of course, we were using um, technology to, to, to be together on Zoom. Um, in this online space. The projects that were created during the months of the residency, which is still ongoing, um, references not only the health of the artists themselves, of their own bodies and minds, but also the health of the collective system, cultural system, institutional uh, structures, economy, and society. Um, if the pandemic has sort of turned the spotlight on our health individually, it's also laid bare that every structure, local, global, um, 
informs and fulfills our own health, right? So the projects which, um, which the artists will speak about today, but all 10 artists in the residency um, are still completing their projects, which will be on exhibition individual art, in the visual arts gallery, um, include interactive video, wearable sculpture, painting, embroidery, ceramic sculpture, and uh, a narrative zine. Uh, the four artists presenting today are gonna share details about their work in particular, their process, and their journeys through the residency in making this work, um, as well as their own health and life during this difficult year. Um, the projects inevitably have taken on the form of self-portraits, and so off many times the work itself reflects that journey. Um, in the presentations today, we'll see four very different um, interpretations of health, um, as well as four di very different methods of art making. Um, I want to welcome you all today and encourage you to save the date, uh, end of October uh, and November, to come and see the work in person, hopefully, uh, in the fall at the Visual Arts Gallery at NJCU. Um, welcome and thank you all. I wanted to just um, let you know that we'll be splitting the presentations into two parts. Avni Palikwala and Stephanie Tishner will present with a short Q&A session. And then Christy Lopez and Mary Jays will round out the event with another short Q&A at the end. Um, I'm gonna be adding their website information in the chat so that you can view their work as well in that way. And I would ask you to please put comments, applause, high fives, and, and of course, any of your questions into the chat. I will be reading questions from the chat during the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Our first artist to present, Avni Palikwala is a New Jersey-based artist and maker working in numerous mediums since 2000, from a very young age, stories of imaginary worlds provided both an escape and inspiration. With a digital portfolio that encompasses many forms of storytelling, including animation and games, narratives have always resonated with Avni. The tales of women from varied and complex backgrounds in particular can be seen in her pastel portraits. Falling outside of simple classification, her degrees in fine arts and computer science reveal a keen interest in both the traditions of the past and emerging technologies, most significantly the creative potential that sits at their intersection. A fascination with reinterpreting objects and ideas emerged during her graduate work at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program, ITP. Her projects experiment with interaction and experience from changing the way time is displayed via a mechanized lotus that opens over the course of a day to engaging users of all ages to explore binary numbers through playing a large scale interactive interface. This is her first time participating in the Wonder Women residency. Welcome Avni Palikwala. Hello, um, my name is Avni Pokiwala and I will be talking about the project that I made for um, the Wonder Woman residency. And as Doris mentioned, this is my first time um, participating in the residency. So it's been a great experience. Next. So a little bit about me. Um, I do have a background in traditional art. I have a degree in fine arts. And um, although I do work in abstract, uh, I also prefer the represent, re representational and figurative art. Next. Um, on the professional front, I work in the digital sphere. Um, some of my work includes things like branding for startups. Um, I've done interface design for exhibits and websites. And I've also created games for um, kids to help them get interested in science. Next. 
So I do work in a variety of mediums, um, but the thread that kind of runs through all of my work is that it's all focused on the external world. Um, as you can see on the picture in the right, um, I, I'm making some shoes. Um, although I don't meditate, I found that art and making um, is my meditation. And when I get very, very busy and that kind of drops off, I really, really feel a lack of it. And I know that I need to get back to it. And so when I heard about the Wonder Woman residency, I thought, you know, this is a really good opportunity for me to shift and kind of look inward and make work about myself for the first time. Next. Um, so the Wonder Woman residency is really um, a great experience. Um, when I heard that the theme was health, it really resonated with me, especially with everything that's been going on for the past year. Um, I've never worked in this kind of format before. I've always worked as kind of a solitary creative. Um, and so to have um, other women work alongside other women artists um, for at this point months at a time on a weekly basis has been just fantastic. Um, hearing the other women's stories um, about their personal health um, and their journeys and their frankness has been really, really inspiring to me. And it absolutely influenced the work that I made and its trajectory. Next. Um, so a little bit about my project. Um, my project is about my health. Since I was a child, uh, my body has been telling me that something is wrong. Uh, as I've gotten older, the signals have gotten more frequent and increased in severity. Um, during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, like a lot of people, I started baking and cooking and indulging, and it was fun. Um, but I also found that my physical health started to deteriorate rapidly. Um, but it wasn't really in proportion to the amount I was eating and indulging. Um, and so at the same time, um, I started to hurt my feet a lot as well. And I just started to bang into things all the time. And the reason that I was doing that was because I couldn't actually feel my feet very well. I was losing feeling in them. And so one day what I decided to do um, was I took a temperature gun and I took the temperature of my feet and I took the temperature of my husband's feet and there was a 25 degree difference. And I think that was when I realized something is very, very wrong and I really have to face it and figure out what's going on. Next. So during the residency and in talking with all these women, um, I kind of took a step back and realized, you know, the story of my body started almost a decade ago. And it really started when um, I wanted to have children and I was unsuccessful. And so um, I began fertility treatments and fertility treatments are very, very hard on your body. Um, they're also hard mentally, emotionally, not to mention very challenging financially. And I went through years of fertility treatments and I was lucky, I was able to get pregnant. And um, after I had my first child, um, I had a lot of issues with low milk supply. And I, for seven to eight months, was hooked up to a pump to pump milk um, for three to four hours a day. And I tried everything, but ultimately I just could not make enough milk for my daughter's daily needs. Um, after I weaned my daughter, um, I had reconstructive surgery done to address pain that I'd been having for at least a decade. And um, a few months after reconstructive surgery, I found myself pregnant, surprisingly, um, um, without the help of any fertility drugs. And although I was in much better shape for this pregnancy, due to the fact I didn't need fertility treatments, I developed gestational diabetes. 
Um, and I spent a good portion of the pregnancy just trying to manage the gestational diabetes um, and manage the rising insulin needs that I needed. And um, although I don't know if it was the gestational diabetes, my son was born a month premature. Um, he is perfectly healthy now, but it was very, very tough. Um, and then more recently, as I investigated what was going on with my health, looking back through medical records and talking to um, a medical practitioner, I was able to get confirmation that I do have an autoimmune disease. Next. Um, so in thinking about the project I was going to do, um, I knew I wanted to do a narrative self-portrait. And I thought about everything that my body had done for me, which was a lot, which is a lot, um, as, you, as you just heard. Um, but then I think more challenging for me was I had to really accept the things that my body can't do for me. And that's a lot harder. Um, like it couldn't make milk, enough milk for my daughter, no matter how hard I try. Um, my body can't run a marathon, although I've tried my hardest. Um, can't even run more than three miles without physically being exhausted for days afterwards and having excruciating pain. Um, my body had been telling me this for years, but you know, I just really wasn't listening. I thought through sheer force of will, I can get my body to do those things, but I realized that I can't. And so now I've decided to listen to it and I hope that I can be in a better place and make peace with my body and ultimately start to regain my health. Next. And so in thinking about what project I was going to make, I knew it was going to be um, an unconventional self-portrait. And I started thinking a lot about symbols. Um, for me, as someone who designs games and websites, um, symbols are everywhere. Um, whether you're a gamer or not, you may recognize the symbols on the left. Um, but everyone these days texts and part of texting is the use of emojis and whether it's one emoji or like a string of emojis um, those emojis are telling a story next and so i started thinking about what were the symbols of my story and i knew that i wanted to have bold graphic shapes and some of these symbols may be recognizable to you or they may not. And I think that really just depends on your lived experience. And that's uh, perfectly fine. Um, I think things can be more interesting that way. Um, but I do wanna talk about the first symbol on the left. And that is a symbol of the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland is a butterfly shaped gland that sits in your neck and is responsible for metabolic processes throughout your body. And so when the thyroid gland does not function properly, like it for me, whether it's underactive or overactive, um, it causes a lot of issues throughout your body systems. Um, but for everybody, this manifests in different ways and in different severities. And that is why diseases of the thyroid are very, very hard to diagnose. Next. So then I started thinking about how I was gonna tell my story. And I knew I wanted to use the shape of a mandala with my story 10 years ago, starting in the beginning and slowly through time, working my way outwards. Next. So once I had the idea in place, I started working on the design throughout the course of the residency and once I had the vocabulary, I thought about how I would lay things out, and I was very cognizant of how things were in terms of their relation to each other, in terms of placement, size, how often things are repeated, and negative space. And then I finally had a design um, a few weeks in that I really felt told the story I wanted to tell. Next. And so I turned my attention to how I was gonna make this make the piece because I knew I didn't wanna keep it in the digital realm, but I wanted to make a physical piece. So I experimented with a number of mediums and although they were all interesting in their own ways, I didn't feel like, oh, this is it, next. And so I thought, 
what better object for self-reflection than a mirror? Um, and once I had my canvas selected, um, I knew that I could use digital tools to kind of explore the design possibilities. I knew I wanted to use a permanent process to mark and um, put the design onto the mirror surface. And so I chose the process of etching. Um, etching is very interesting because with etching and a mirror, you can control what is seen and what is obscured. Next. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process of making my project, because for me, uh, I work iteratively. Uh, I'm always making versions of a project. And so um, for me, process is very important as well as being interesting and often can be more interesting than the final product itself. So I first ran a number of tests. Um, I had the digital design in place and then what I wanted to do was I cut the design out on adhesive vinyl using a machine called the Cricut Maker. And in the middle there, you can see um, the test that I did. And then I took um, this vinyl and I adhered it to a test sur surface. And in this case, it was just a recyclable wine bottle I had. Next. And then I took the etching medium, the armor etch, and I laid it over the surface of the wine bottle, um, waited the prescribed amount of time, which I think was five to 10 minutes. I removed the etching medium. And as you can see on the right, um, that's the final result. And this test was really, really important because it showed me um, what was possible with the etching, um, what was possible with the self-adhesive vinyl, what was, if, it, if the line weight was too thin, what was too thick, how close I could keep objects together. Um, next. So then when I had that test done, I updated my design and um, started making my project. So on the left, you can see um, a close up of the cutout design. And then in the middle, um, you can see uh, my fir the first um, vinyl piece kind of set on the mirror. Um, the, the piece itself, the mirror, is quite large, so I had to cut out each section separately and, then lay, left. and then lay it across. Um, I also overlapped some of the sections to make sure um, that, the so that the pieces lined up well. Um, otherwise, since everything is a circle, anything that's a little bit off, you would really be able to tell. Next. Then I, outside, um, because there are fumes, I laid a thick layer of etching medium down. I actually used a paint roller and I left it for about 10 to 15 minutes to make sure that everything got etched really well. And then I cleaned off the surface of the mirror. Then I let it dry and I very, very carefully and painstakingly, often with tweezers, started to remove the adhesive vinyl. This process took a number of hours. I think I did it over the course of two to three days. Um, as you can see in the picture, um, the mirror being shown underneath the vinyl where the vinyl came off. Next. So this is the final, I guess, product or project. And um, there, it's, it's just one mirror. And these are pictures of the mirror in different lighting conditions. And it looks quite different based on the lighting and in the, the environment. And I felt like that was also a very interesting turn that I didn't expect. Next. So um, I just wanted to, to say that about this project, um, it's, it's been really challenging for me, uh, talking about such an extremely personal story one that really only my husband knew about because he's been on the journey with me. Um, but my hope is that hearing all of these um, stories through the Wonder Woman project and from other women online, um, we can kind of move the needle in normalizing, discussing women's bodies and our health, not just among ourselves, but to the public at large, because I think everybody benefits when this happens. And I wanna, I hope that we can remove the fear and the shame and the guilt, all of things which I felt and kind of replace them with the community, the support and overall better health outcomes. 
And I hope for my daughter's generation that they just start out with the community and the support and the better health. So I wanna thank everybody um, for coming to this talk. And as Dora said, I hope we get to see you um, in the fall in person at the gallery show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abni. Our next speaker is Stephanie Tishner. Stephanie is an artist and an art educator who throughout her career has chosen to work with children. Stephanie finds children infinitely inspirational. Their energy, thirst for knowledge and insights are gleeful. Her aesthetic is childlike and messy, obsessive and sweet. Stephanie's inspirations for works in fiber and paint are found in books, in travel and in her backyard. She attempts to softly and gently capture the world. She exposes this world its, its inhabitant, and its inhabitants with a sincere curiosity and believes in good, clean fun and being nice. Her other influences include plants, animals, topography, cartoons, video games, plastic bits, toys, games, fruit, candy, sweets, and treats. Previous works include sewn thread paintings of stuffed animals and an acrylic painted color study, color studies of licorice. She is living and working in Seattle, Washington with her husband and her children. This is her second time participating in the Wonder Women residency. Welcome Stephanie Tishner. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, who am I? I'm a Wonder Woman. Um, I want to talk about the residency briefly as I can. Um, when the pandemic hit, just like yours, my whole world shut down. Um, and we, I was locked in with my family. Um, it gave me back time with my big kid who was out of the house more, you know, play dates and sleepovers and such as she's getting older. It gave me back my little guy had just started going to school out of the house a little bit and he was back. Um, my husband was in the house and he was able to change pull-ups during, you know, in between calls. Um, and those are the things it gave me, but what it took was kind of every moment of my time. I was needed more than I had ever been needed. I, um, I didn't have any room or space to even think about creating. Um, when the call for the residency came out, um, I made myself do it. I, you know, applied. And when I was, um, when the residency began, it gave me like permission, and it gave me time. <laughs> it gave me community, um, and that's without even getting into the topic. It gave me time to talk about art and to be an artist. And I am very grateful to find community during COVID times. So that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so who am I? I'm Stephanie Tischner. I am a Wonder Woman. Next slide, please. I'm a fiber artist and painter, now living in Seattle, but always will be a Jersey girl. Um, themes of my work uh, center around critters and creatures and patterns and colors. Um, uh, this this project that I'm doing right now um, is called Paint Atlas 2021, and that's the name for the overall project. But as you see, I am a maximalist and I made a few things. Um, here you can see uh, a self-portrait. I often do uh, self-portraits in my work. Next slide, please. And here is a project from 2007. Um, and I showed this piece in Jersey City. It is uh, another piece that I did about my body. You can see my crooked spine and my other parts of my body that I have some issues with. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a lot. This is um, a bunch of diagnosis that I have. Um, most of them I'm still living with and living through. And I made the slide to kind of like 
let you all sit with how much it is and how much it is to carry around, how much it is to carry from place to place. I feel like it's stamped on me when I walk into a new doctor. Um, it's a list that's in my back pocket that I'm, yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> so there's the history of me as an artist and then there's the history of me as a patient. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> this is some portraits of doctors and I'm calling it some doctors that never knew me. And that has to do with our broken medical system and how there is no time for them to treat a chronic patient that our system is, you know, a 15 minute allotment for them to put a bandaid on you. But when you're a chronic health warrior, um, it's a bit trickier to find the person that's gonna listen and find the person that's gonna help. And those relationships, um, I just wish they were stronger <laughs> and wish that they were more important. And I do not blame the doctors. I think that they all go into medicine with good intention. I would never blame them, but um, it's the system. It's broken. Okay, <laughs> next slide. Playing telephone. And this has to do with um, the communication with the doctors and, and my own issue of um, verbalizing what I'm actually experiencing in my body. And I really hope that this project makes that a little bit clearer. I want to portray the actual, what I'm experiencing. And I hope it'll be helpful to some people out there. Um, so medicine is not one size fits all. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So these here things are the bane of my existence. They are pain charts. Um, on the top, you can see these silly faces. And if you uh, end up in the hospital for a broken arm or stub toe, they will probably ask you to point to which one of these goofy faces you're feeling. Um, if you go to the doctors maybe more often, you might have to fill out the other type of pain chart you see right here, um, where you put little marks on your body, your body, of where um, things are bugging you. Now, the problem is <laughs> these don't represent me. They do not portray my symptoms. They, I don't see how those little dots are actually telling my story. Next slide, please. So I needed to start from the beginning and redesign the pain chart. Um, I wanted a female instead of an androgynous male figure. I wanted someone with some hips. <laughs> I wanted someone that represented me better. Next slide, please. So I needed to start translating my feelings, my pain, my different experiences into symbols and colors. Just wanna briefly mention that during the residency, I found out that there's a name for something I experienced. It's synesthesia. And that's when, well, I'll just tell you my experience of it is um, certain pain that I feel, I actually see colors and I've had this experience with different energy therapy, different things, but I see very specific colors with different feelings. Um, and I wrote a little poem. <laughs> Pain has color and weight and flashes and brights. It has twists and turns and sudden burns and bam, lightning bolts. Can I show you how it feels? Next slide, please. I realized that I needed to start recording using these symbols. So now I have like a vocab and symbols and colors and a pain chart and I need to start recording. Um, so this is one day, one moment um, in time. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. Um, next slide, please. So I'm realizing I, it's not a painting. It's not a one-off thing. I have to record it over and over and over and over to show that it's a constant, different, changing 
you just never know what's about to happen. And I'm mostly here talking about fibromyalgia. Um, I have a lot of other issues, as you saw on the pain slide, uh, on the diagnosis slide. But this is mainly have, has to do with my constant, you know, uh, spine stuff and fibromyalgia. Um, the next series of slides, next slide, the next series of slides um, will be some daily um, diary of the pain slides. And uh, I'm just going to go over the main ailment of the day um, pretty quickly. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is February 20th. And the main problem of the day was deep penetrating pain in my chest and abdomen. Next. February 21st, tingling numb thighs were bugging me. Next. March 8th, gnawing agony in my chest. More on that. Here's the bad selfie. It turned out that during the residency, I was hospitalized for a new and really scary ailment. I had um, pulmonary embolisms, blood clots in my lungs. And this is where I could tell right away how important this daily diary was. It wasn't just a um, beautiful collection of, you know, squiggly figurative situation. Um, it was actually diagnostic. It was telling me, you know, once I looked back that leading up to this issue, I like, I really have to listen to my body. Um, thankfully, I went to the ER and found out that, you know, I had these pulmonary embolisms. But I think if I wasn't focused up um, and trusting my body, it could have ended a, a different way. Um, next slide. And pulmonary embolisms, if you don't know, it's blood clots. So there's blood clots in my lungs. <clears throat> March 10th, cramping in my hip. March 19th, cluster of pricks in both of my thighs. Prick, 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 prick. March 20th. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Tight squeezing in my stomach. March 21st, penetrating deep pain in my shoulders and neck. March 23rd, tiring, exhausting, and continuous pain in my chest. And that's still the embolisms. March 25th, burning hot pain in my abdomen and hip. March 29th, miserable pain in my sinuses and knee. What's that, April 4? April 2nd, aching, sore, dull pain on the tops of my feet. So as you can see, there's other stuff going on each day. And I'm just telling you, like, here's the major annoyance. Next slide. Well, dang. It's a lot. It's a lot for me. It's a lot for my family. Um, but knowing that this tool could actually be helpful, maybe not just communication wise, but um, compiling information that I could maybe bring to my doctor, it, be, it ended up being pretty powerful. So here comes, next slide. <laughs> here comes Little Steph. So Little Steph is a fabric sculpture, self-portrait doll that's interactive. Um, that I hope you will come play with in the gallery. Um, so I often use like a separation. Um, I separate myself from the pain uh, when it gets unbearable. I separate myself from the uncomfortable experience of many, many tests that I've endured. Um, and also through this residency, I've learned the word for that. It's dissociation. Um, but it's a way to, little stuff is a way to explore these types of things from like a little bit of a safe distance. 
Next slide, please. Mirror, mirror. So humor and play are the other co coping mechanisms that I have for what's going on in my body. Um, this is a hand and machined embroidery um, detail of the face of middle step. Next slide. Minutes left. Oh my goodness. Next slide. <laughs> What a doll. So this is a just a detail of actually how I physically make these crazy things. So I draw and pull and tug and move um, the fabric on the machine to draw. I sometimes sketch in pencil and, and sometimes I just go for it and I break a lot of sewing machines, like a lot. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Um, I also made these little organs for little stuff that are like little squishy pillows that are embroidered. Um, just the major ailments there. I made into little things that you can take in and out. Next slide. So you can open her body up and um, play with the organs and put them back in. Next slide, please. So there she is. Um, that's not the finished part, but I also have the opening in her back, and that has to do with the one million surgeries that I've had on my back, um, my spine for scoliosis, and then many repair jobs after. And I wanted like a physical, gross um, scar became really important to me. So that's me trying to build up and make it um, yeah, thick and gnarly like on big stuff here. Next slide. I'm oh my god, I'm out of time. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> I didn't want to end without things that that help throughout my day and throughout my life. So this is just things that help little Steph and I. Um, touch, music, love, CBD oil, meds, massage, heat, hugs, friendship, zone and out with like a Netflix type of sitch, Animal Crossing New Horizons. That's very helpful for me. Um, next slide. And I really didn't tell you about the movie, but this is what the diary turned into. Um, compiling days and days and days and days, sometimes multiple times a day of my diary. Um, this is it building up and this is how one day went for me. And that is that. Thank you. And I hope that to see you, is there another slide? Next slide. <laughs> um, I hope to see you guys in the gallery and I really thank you for coming. Thank you, Steph. Okay, so I want to um, just uh, revisit the chat a bit. There are a couple questions, but I wanted to also um, sort of go back in the sort of overall sharing of these much more personal stories. You know, we've used words like taboo a lot in the residency and today, um, you know, speaking about what may be pain or something that is, that needs to be corrected or medicated. Hi, little Steph. Hi. <laughs> um, little Steph will be answered. We'll be taking questions if you have something specific for little Steph as well. Um, and so it's interesting that I think in speaking, especially in this more public way, um, we can sort of dispel some of the taboos that others might feel about their own stories. Um, I think those taboos become internalized as well. Like we don't even have discussions with ourselves sometimes about what's wrong because we don't have discussions with others often about what's wrong. And that sometimes even translates in the doctor's office, like you're already taking the step to get there and you still are not complete in your description. So I think that, um, that that's something that's coming through. Um, so I'll read a few um, of the comments, um, lots of applause and accolades. Um, thank you for sharing this incredible personal story from Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Refat. Um, Anjali Boxy says, this is really amazing. You have such a gift, Avni. Thank you for using it for this project. Um, 
So lots of thanks for sharing, right? This idea that in sharing the personal story, um, maybe we're helping. Um, Christine Decruz says, yes, let's all build, build about health to help each other uh, through these painful, often lonely experiences. How can you make something that's lonely, which pandemic has often been, uh, into something that is shared and maybe it becomes more powerful or just maybe accessible and easier to diagnose. Um, and so um, Eileen also says, it's very powerful to discuss health and fertility challenges in particular. You're definitely making this normal for others. Um, I know there was a fertility um, story about unsuccessful fertility journey. Um, and so just to kind of, you know, dispel some of those, um, you know, sort of taboos that, uh, that make you paralyzed in speaking. Um, that was so beautiful, Avni, sorry, Doris, that you said that you were lucky that it did work. Yes, I, and I think about that all the time. You know, I think that, um, I think that although it was hard to go through it, um, I think it really gave me an appreciation um, when something does not come easy to you. You know what I'm saying? And I always think about no matter what, like how lucky I am, because that is not the outcome. Although they don't tell you that, it's not guaranteed, right? They don't tell you that because they wanna take your money, right? So um, I think that that's kind of what I learned that um, to also be more aware of what other people feel and what other people's journeys are and to never make any kind of assumptions, which I think before I started, that trying to have children, I, I was just, I didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, here is a question from Eileen, a bit of a comment and a question. Eileen Farrar says, I love the use of symbols in both Stephanie and Avni's work as a means to describe a health pain journey. It would be great if they could discuss the experience of working with similar graphic iconic imagery and how the collective affected the imagery whoever would like to go first and then maybe the other. We definitely have um, some shared imagery, some shared stories of me and I, and that's, um, we kind of paired up um, for this talk in that way. Um, symbols and um, crazy mark making is, is how I work. Um, I study textile design and repeated patterns and symbols are throughout all of my work. Um, but I definitely, I'm using them as communication, just like Avni. Um, I think what's interesting is, um, although there is definitely overlap in our uh, journeys, and although I do work with textiles, I feel like stuff is coming from the opposite place where hers is like hand drawn, and it's got this like, be like beautiful kind of like, um, I don't know, it, it just, it's, it looks like a beautiful painting. And then mine is very graphic and bold and very much influenced by my background working on computers all the time, working in Illustrator. Um, I also work as an illustrator. So for me, like the vector look of it is like always very much in my psyche. Although I love the hand-drawn look for me, I, I guess working in um, vector-based art for 20 years is just, it just, comes more naturally to me now. And I, I feel like for me, I'm able to communicate more strongly um, in a vector based shape. And also I think that, you know, being surrounded by interfaces all day and the phone. And for me, I'm always like, like seeing symbols and noticing them and, and seeing, oh, is this a good interface? I think it drives my husband crazy because he's like, you know, just, just use it. Stop talking about whether it's good or bad, but I can't help it just because it's kind of, um, what I do day in and day out. So another comment from Jazz Graph, um, I believe this is for uh, Little Stuff. Yes, Queen, the crown is dope. Um, Thank you. Oil your sewing machines like crazy. She also asks, are the symbols like badges? Um, that's funny because I was actually wearing one this morning. <laughs> I was putting them on me and little stuff today. Um, so yeah, why not? They're like patches. They, um, I had actually gone through like 
one million, sorry, one million and one ideas um, with the symbols. And I thought of actually doing temporary tattoos and putting them on my, my body. Little Steph can have the felt hand cut symbols and I could have um, some tattooed symbols. Um, I also hope to have a takeaway that is um, a folded paper. It's not really a zine, I'm not Sharon, she's, she's a zine woman, but it's a folded paper that you open up to a poster of that image of the shapely lady um, and a pack of stickers and you can do your own pain chart. Um, and hey, maybe you could actually really bring it to your doctor or something, that'd be so cool. If you do anything like that, please email me um, or what have you. But yeah, they're badges that like, I mean, I'm a pain warrior, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So and I, I like, this is a, a rhetorical question, but I'd like to read it. When has pain ever been so beautiful? Uh, and not that all diagnoses and health is about just relieving pain, you know, that's a kind of a simplistic way of thinking about it. But uh, certainly when you're thinking about that as a goal, uh, it is interesting to sort of how do you flip it? So Steph, do you think that um, my, this is a little bit of my question, which I can't find now, but um, do you think that in creating this kind of accessible like body map, I think both of your work has this kind of map quality, um, but do you think that in creating this body map, it does make the conversation more accessible for yourself? Like, is it an internal exercise or is it an external exercise? And, and is, is it both? Is it both? Maybe it's both. I think it's both, but I think um, it's definitely, I mean, like when you, I was saying it's like a diagnostic tool, it's, yeah, it's both. It's, it's helpful for me to like, not just verbalize it, but to see it and to see it built up and to, have a different understanding. Like I, I go through all these like medicine and, and you know medication changes, and the doctor's like, oh, did this do this? Did this help? And I, like, I can't see it. It's like the part of my brain that is filled with all this. It's like taking over my whole brain. It's hard for me to say, oh, well, this changed or this slightly changed, and and seeing it as a visual that I can like refer to like literally look at during my online doctor's appointment. Um, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> I think that's the answer. <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, I, yeah, I was curious if you, like it's, it's obviously like your diary, but everybody's like, hack the pain chart, you know, let's all use this tool. And I think that's, that, that was maybe part of your like unintended sort of result is that, of course, this could be used for others, right? It's yeah, I hope so. I want to make it a clicky download thing on my website that somebody could help me with because I don't know how to do that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I have um, a few more comments um, that I would like to read, um, but um, Jazz says she would totally wear your badge. So that's, I think there's probably some others that share that. Um, Sharon Whitfield says, I think it is the whole um, SOAP, subjective objective assessment and plan process that physicians use. Most physicians with the, object, with the objective more heavily than women's subjective reports. And so this idea of like gender bias in health, I think is also something little Steph is really addressing, right? That there is so much bias um, in healthcare um, that of course in each story kind of comes out. Do you want to speak to that, either one of you? Um, I think I think what I've, and I didn't mention this in the talk, but, um, and Doris, you know this, that the, we've discussed this, that the, especially thyroid disorders, and I don't know stuff about fibromyalgia, but thyroid disorders, 90% of thyroid disorders affect women. So it is a very um, women-centric disease. And I think that's also another layer on top of why it's so hard to diagnose because although the ailments are um, body-wide and they're sometimes can be fairly general, like, you know, that can be passed off as you just had a baby, you're working too much, you know, um, 
just, you know, um, exercise more, whatever. There's all these ways to address it, but it's not actually what's going on in your body. So I think that's when I've really seen the bias come up. Um, and I actually started writing down all the things that have been said to me over the last 10 years. And when I added it up, it's kind of crazy, right? Like it just, it, it, I don't know. It's just like people shooting in the dark, giving you advice, but you know, it doesn't really address anything. Um, so that's, that's like, from what I've seen, I've seen that gender bias, um, um, like, yeah, I think I'm sure it's prevalent in other other um, therapeutic areas too. Yeah, it's definitely uh, fibromyalgia. I don't know the numbers, but um, it is diagnosed more in women than men. Um, that triggered a few things for me. I've had a doctor tell me like, "Oh, you just you just feel things more." I'm like, "What does that mean?" You know, um, and, and and things like that. Like, it's definitely uh, I I feel the gender bias. But I also, with my pain chart and what you guys just said, made me think about like the bias against weight stuff with doctors, mm -hmm. that they'll blame every single thing on your weight. And it's like, baby, I'm moving. I'm still moving. Like, this is not, I don't know. When I had the, with the um, pulmonary embolism stuff, that was like the first, like, oh, it's your weight. I'm like, what? Like, how is, you know, oh, okay. So now I'm just going to get a lot of, blood clots because I don't know it's super frustrating so yes being a larger woman like yeah there's a lot of bias in in medicine <laughs> um so I guess I'll I'll uh, wrap up with one more question and of course you know we've spoken about bias as well Sharon Dela Cruz the zine the zine you mentioned which which feels activist right like when we think about like media um media based work that can exist in a in a fine art gallery space but looks like a sort of like public facing piece right like a zine or a website or something that feels easily um distributed um you know feels like it has this kind of activist intention a zine feels activist because of its distribution um and sharon de la cruz of course her zine is about medical apartheid and discrimination based on race when it comes to medicine um but I think my, my last question, um, unless anyone else comes in and, and uh, puts one into the chat, uh, is do you see the work as activist, um, both of your pieces? And you know, both of your work in particular are, are interactive in the physical gallery space. Uh, and I know Steph, you've talked about there's lots of layers and maybe there'll be a, a sort of a web facing piece that could become more interactive. Um, but in the gallery, the work is is interactive. Do you Im also imagine it as activist because of the content? And if so, what do you imagine the participant viewer, uh, visitor uh, will receive or give to the work when experiencing it? Do you need to go first, Avni, or I don't want to? Uh <laughs> you know, I was actually thinking about this question today. Um, my daughter is five and she told me in the car that she learned today that um, women were not always allowed to vote. And um, I remember a friend of mine told me when her daughter learned that she started to cry. Um, and it got me thinking, you know, I, I always want my daughter and my son to kind of know about the history of things, right? Um, because they're important that we don't forget. And so um, I think that for me, like documenting my my journey and putting it out there. And um, although it's become much more in the narrative, especially with social media, um, even though I saw that, I still felt like um, it was still hard, right? And I think because with the collective and maybe because you all were almost virtual strangers, it was a little bit easier. And that's kind of how, like I saw when I made my piece, yeah, it's out there, um, but I'm not gonna see, know who sees it, but maybe they'll, based on their experience, if they've been through one of these things, recognize it and say, oh, well, like, look, somebody else is doing this and they're on the other end of it, or at least further than I was. And, you know, because when you're in it, like you, you know you should share, but it's so isolating. All you can do is kind of put your head down and just try to get through it, right? Like, and say, I, 
I know I should talk about this, but I can't right now, but I will at some point. And like, but then I never just did. And I think this is the first time that I just did, thanks to you all really. Um, and so I think that's what I'm hoping. Um, it kind of opens the door for at least one person to kind of feel like maybe they can talk to somebody about some things. Awesome. Yeah, I think mine is like, a, a quieter activism, perhaps, like a more playful, but I do think making a piece about health is political and I think it is activism. And I think that if you can change your relationship with your doctor, demand more time, demand to be understood, I think that's activism. I think that's political. I think that you know, I have actually brought a painting to the doctors before <laughs> when I had migraines. I did like a painting of the aura. I was like, no, but this is what I'm saying. I think just it's, yeah, communicating, being heard is, is activism and it's political. Thank you to both of you and for anyone Alicia Wright is saying, this is such a wonderful discussion. It was so thought provoking and so authentic. Thank you so much for your courage and honesty. Your creativity is powerful. Christine DeCruz says, creating safe spaces is the most important thing. It is the most important for sharing difficult things. Um, so also create safe spaces for others perhaps, right? We can do that. Um, thank you so much. If you, if anyone listening, uh, would like to um, continue to put comments for Stephanie and Avni in the chat. They'll be here through the rest of the event. You can also ask questions. We'll be concentrating questions for our next presenters, um, Christy Lopez and Mary Jays in the, in the end uh, Q&A, but uh, really you can ask questions for anyone. Uh, and you know, feel free to uh, to uh, put things into the chat. The artists will be able to go back later and see it as well. So uh, you can send them some messages. Okay, so as um, we move into the second part, I wanted to recognize there are some, I mean, there's lots of uh, sort of thematic connections between all 10 of the artists. Obviously we were, we've all been influencing each other through these meetings. Um, and there's threads, of course, that come directly from the theme. And then there are other threads that sort of start to come out uh, and some projects might feel connected. And I think one of the threads that we thought about in, in putting the talk together was um, an idea about like a personal journey in mental health. And um, as Stephanie and Avni have spoken mostly about uh, physical health, although it's hard to extract one from the other, but uh, spoke more specifically about a physical health journey uh, in their work, in their projects. Um, in Christy Lopez's project and Mary J's project, uh, we're looking at more of a mental health space critique journey. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce uh, our first uh, uh, speaker, Christy Lopez, uh, who is an artist uh, and middle school teacher, art educator at West Orange, in West Orange, New Jersey. Uh, she's a New Jersey based artist. She studied art history and art education at NJCU. Shout out to the alum of the group. <laughs> um, while at NJCU, she was dabbling in many art mediums while deepening an appreciation for philosophy and art criticism. Christy was a board of director for the Art Educators of New Jersey, surfing as co-chair for the State Youth Art Month program. She was awarded two National Claire Flanagan Memory Grand Memorial Grand Awards by the Council for Art Education, and she looks forward to extending her arts advocacy locally and globally. This is the first time she is participating in the Wonder Woman residency. Welcome, Christy Lopez. That's Lucio. Excuse Thank him. Thank you. Hi, Lucio. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I don't see my slides, so I'm just gonna 
um, wait for my slides, I guess. There they are. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for staying for the second half of the talk. Uh, yes, this is my first Wonder Woman uh, participation and um, first like real concentration in art for an art show. Um, and I'll explain why next. So a little bit about me. Um, I did graduate from NJCU at the end of 2013. I did uh, my student teaching in Jersey City. I ended up working afterwards in Jersey City for a year and a half. Um, I also did a maternity leave position. So kind of hit the ground running right out of school. And I feel like my ambition to just keep doing stuff has always been there. Um, so I, I left college and then went on to, um, then I left Jersey City and went on to West Orange. And there I started to do the Youth Art Month program with Art Educators of New Jersey, where I actually met Sharon. Sharon's in the bottom left over there talking, um, doing her, her talk for the, for the high school students. And uh, it was just a, a way, I think, of me staying busy after personal stuff happened. Um, and maybe also trying to keep one foot in the art world without actually making anything really. Like uh, I think photography might have been there all along, but personal works always kind of took a back seat to my professional ambition and job security. Uh, but I did end up winning awards and I realized that it was a lot. I was doing a lot. I need to slow down and really think about what I want to do with myself instead of just filling out like a checklist of things for other organizations. Next. <clears throat> Next, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, so artist versus art teacher. Um, I'm gonna say this once and never again, this is the last time I'm saying it. That phrase that people say, those who can't do teach, I wanna bury it because I, for a while I started believing it. I started thinking that um, to be an artist, you really needed to concentrate in something. You couldn't just do a little bit of everything. And that made it hard to commit to something. Um, but to be an art teacher, you gotta know a little bit of everything because your curriculum usually goes through a variety of mediums. Um, so I wanted to learn everything. I, like, I wanna do photography, I wanna do clay. I want... So I didn't really touch clay until NJCU, until my first, um, my ceramics one class. And I only took ceramics one. But I knew that I wanted to at least get a job in a school that had a kiln that had clay. And on my interview, they were like, what's your weakest, your strengths and your weaknesses? What's your weakness? I was like, clay, because like, I don't do it enough and I want to. But as an artist, uh, the voice in my head was always very critical and, and um, like stifling in a way. Like don't express yourself until all of your thoughts are really there. And so that started to unfold into my mental health and seeing that inner voice wasn't just there when I was creating, um, but it's kind of there all the time. Um, so next. Uh, once uh, remote learning happened, the pandemic hit, right? And so you all know about teaching. A remote learning, um, maybe you have kids. So the year started out with kids showing their their screens and showing their works. And I was like, all right, you know, I got this, I can do this. And it was slowly burning out, slowly just expecting too much of myself. Um, people were doing videos, instructional videos, and like a video to me takes hours and hours of planning and subtitles, and I didn't have time for that. Um, so I started feeling like I wasn't doing a good enough job at what I was from home, you know? Uh, by the end of the year, the students didn't really wanna turn the cameras off. Even, even when I say, please keep your cameras on, they all had them off. So it's, it's starting to like dwindle. This was like near February. And then once we are, were back in the classroom, um, my mental health also just changed. So I think being home uh, in the room had its effects, being home all year had its effects. The winter, uh, the cold, 
all of that was very hard to overcome. Um, and so it was really a joy when Doris reached out to me about a community um, next. The community that I started with was Kaipedik, and it's a um, various artists that come to show their work and we all give feedback. And it was kind of like a crit group, just like in college. And I hadn't been in that kind of environment in a while. I left the advocacy realm for a little while. So it was, it was so nice to be connected to other people who were in the same, in the same pandemic at home, trying to do something from their desks in their room or wherever they are. So that was really um, a community that that I felt like I could express myself. I could start to find words and I did. I ended up writing a poem, which I, I kind of avoided writing down feelings for a long time. I think because I know once I start writing it down, it'll come out and I have to let it go. And the controller in me is like, no, keep it together, keep it together. So this group and uh, Wonder Woman that came up, that, that confronted me with my withdrawal. I was kind of like keeping myself away from, from things, um, a, a variety of different things. And I noticed that I was suppressing trauma. I was self-sabotaging. Um, I was dealing with burnout. I learned I had depression, um, most likely anxiety also it was a balance of those two beautiful things. And so uh, the poem kind of just unleashed this crack to like start creating and I started doing clay and so one of the questions I've I've answered to people in the group was like why clay and as I dug it through it a little bit more I found that with drawing and painting and things that I had been more familiar with I felt like I needed more of a plan I needed to like draw out what I was doing and make it three-dimensional or there was too much planning and I'm already trying to plan too much with work. So I just needed something I can put in my hands and just go and do and make something, whatever you make, you make it. Um, so clay, it's hands-on. It disrupts my thinking mind from all the other things it wants to do. Uh, it's a repetitive action in, the, in hand building and in, on pottery on the wheel. Um, I would be going back to school at, at the beginning of, of uh, February at the end of January. So I felt that I had access to the materials and eventually I would be able to move from my desk in my room back into my classroom. Um, so this just kind of became what I wanted to concentrate on, what I felt con comfortable concentrating on. Um, I felt that clay is forgiving with mistakes, but also, you know, if it, if it does collapse or fall apart, you can just start over and reuse the clay. Um, and then I learned also the difference between pottery on the wheel with, with a no pedal and with a pedal, which is a different sense of control. Um, next. So uh, eventually the weather started getting better. I got vaccinated and I was like, I'm going on a trip. So I went to uh, Arizona with my best friend and photography, like just being out in nature, being away from these four walls, it just stimulates more. I was moving more, I was walking um, and decision-making became more free. Like, sure, let's do that. I don't care, we could do that later. Like it, there was no itinerary. And I feel like um, my sense of time is usually askew and, and also very harsh. Uh, like really put a lot of pressure on myself to do things at the last minute. Those who know, no. Next. Um, I'm also inspired by my students. So before you saw my uh, some photography that I was doing, but being back in the classroom, it was an unknown. I didn't know what it was gonna look like with more students in the room, with masks on, with mess and trying to like keep the distance between them. Um, what if there was too many of the kids in the room? So my decision-making normally would be like freaking out and trying to control everything. But coming back from my trip, I was like, okay, let it go, be cool, be cool. And then they just kind of took over and their discovery and their journey with this new medium that they've never done anything like this before with, it was very inspiring. Next. So I had to find some sort of work-life balance and 
I'm still in that balance right now. I do yoga, but I haven't really consistently practiced. Um, but I could, you know, it's like riding a bike. As soon as I want to do it, I could. It's just that act of that routine and a little bit of that discipline. And with work, I feel like I'm so disciplined that I make myself sick. And, um, and all of this, I didn't really talk about my appetite here yet, but the work-life balance, when I get too caught up in work, or if I get too caught up in creating something and really fixated and like mm, zoomed in on it, I forget to eat. I lose my appetite. I don't even know I'm hungry. Um, so, so really the balance and this whole journey of mental health in this pandemic and with this community was, was finding people that helped support me and feed me and remind me to eat. And that um, will also give me a little bit of an escape from the monotony of work, work, work. And then at work being a little more laid back and letting things go and not being so hard on myself. And in one day I actually ended up having my principal ask to come in and use the pottery wheel. And so my, my principal is on the left on the bottom. And uh, it, was, it was really weird because normally I'm used to expecting my administrator to um, evaluate and judge and criticize. And I'm already doing that in my head. And so usually when I get evaluated, I'm kind of freaking out. And so when he came in to be more of like a learner and, and experience what was happening in the classroom and see like literally all of the things that I'm juggling, I felt different. And I like, I let go finally of that scrutiny and was a little more compassionate. And I could see that he, um, as, a, as a principal is like, has so much to manage, you know, and ha has, he's like, I'm going to make a single stem flower pot. And I said, okay, we'll see about that. If you don't, you'll make something else. And that's what I should be telling myself. Like, don't be so like, I'm going to make this and that's it. Like you might make something else and that's okay too. So that, that, that process oriented journey um, was really important. Um, next. So uh, from there, I, it was a little difficult to continue to make works from the inside out, I guess one would say. And so I'm kind of thinking outside in here, I'm thinking of people that have supported me through a dark period of my life. Um, and how can I be grateful for their, their presence in my life and how they've helped stimulate creativity. And I, wanted, I, I find that great, being grateful is also a way of practicing um, that, that balance and coming back to like non-attachment, but also like thankful for everything that you have. Um, so these, making these works push me out of this creative block. And so I'd like to show you those works now. Next. Um, this is a uh, four espresso cups that I made for the neighbors next door who helped shovel out my car in January or February. It was a big snowstorm and I was doing it alone and they asked if I needed help. And I have realized I have a problem accepting help. And so I was like, I can't ask you to do that. And they said, are you sure? Like we can help. I said, um, okay. So I, I felt guilty. Like all these, these people are just being so nice. What can I do for them? So two minutes left. Thank you. Um, so I kind of use this project as a thank you. Next. Go a little quicker here. This is for my grandma and my aunt. They have a fruit bowl. They're always pushing food in my face and it's like overflowing in their bowl. So I uh, name this abundance. Next. This cup is for my roommate because I broke the mug that she really liked by accident. And um, and for other reasons too, I wanted to say sorry. So here's a mug for her. Next. This is a mug I made for my best friend that I went on a trip with, and it's um, inspired by one of the pictures that I took on the trip. Adventure, next. This is Bloom for another one of my friends who has also fed me and pushed me um, outdoors and is also very graceful with the way that she uh, lives her life. So I call this Bloom, next. Uh, four more, okay. This is for uh, a very special someone who has just come into my life and also feeds me. 
and uh, it's a soup, it's a lover's soup. So it's a bowl for the soul. Next. This is uh, for my therapist who has been there this year and really asks those hard questions and listens. So it's support. Next. I teach in a middle school and I teach in two middle schools actually. So I'm in between two other um, colleagues and they've been very supportive throughout of all of this. We've shared plans and it's just been so great to be able to turn left, turn right and just have someone there. And also they feed me too and they're great. <laughs> so they deserve cups. Next. And um, finally, this is for a neighbor who gifted me these plants um, last year and I, it was, a great experience to kind of just touch earth and you know nurture life in the form of plants which i hadn't really been too much of a plant person before that so i wanted to give back to her and give her a planter so i named it roots and it kind of looks like a butt so i thought a little bit like the root chakra so i was like why not <laughs> and um so far i, I might add a, about a couple more i realized they made more work so it is a work in progress but that's uh, the works that we have thus far. So thank you for listening. I think that should be the last slide next. Yes. Um, so thank you for listening and following me along my journey as artist and art teacher. Thank you so much, Christy. I think it's an important discussion, especially in the university space to address how teaching and studio practice are often seen. I mean, they're, they're simultaneous and they're supposed to somehow both exist with equal attention. And then you throw a pandemic into all of this and how do we continue to teach to the sort of maximum capacity and have a studio practice and all of these things and still feel like a human being. Um, and so I think that that is a, a conversation uh, that I think young people studying art and teaching imagine that there's this balance that just comes because everybody does it. And it really is extraordinarily difficult um, even when there's not a pandemic, let alone when there's a pandemic. Uh, and everything is upside down. Um, Mary Jays, our next presenter, has prepared, uh, I suppose, a multimedia presentation um, for us. And so she'll be introducing that. I also wanted to uh, remind everyone, again, to put comments and questions in the chat. And I'll be reading those at the conclusion of Mary J's presentation, but also, um, you know, to feel like you can, you know, write messages to the artist directly uh, and write to any of the artists that have presented uh, already as well. Mary J's is a multimedia artist and activist. She has worked to promote social change in nonfiction media settings, including a nonprofit documentary production company, Alban Pictures Incorporated, Hunter College's Integrated Media Arts MFA program, where we met, and the School of Visual Arts with CUNY Graduate Center that respectively sponsored and hosted Where the Truth Lies, a conference on propaganda. She has participated in creative research opportunities, including the Laundromat Projects, Create Change Professional Development Fellowship, and LMCC's Swing Space in New York. She has received grants from Feast in Brooklyn and MACTES. As a guest speaker, she has been invited to Parsons the New School for Design's MFA program in transdisciplinary design and the Whitney Museum of American Arts Independent Study Program's Fix It Yourself lectures. Notable projects include founding a local currency for North Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Torch. In September of 2018, Mary created a co-curation co artist meeting and exhibition series called Regeneration Residency and Exhibition, first piloted in Oakland. She received her MFA, or excuse me, her BFA from the University of Texas at Austin, and she's currently pursuing her BFA in interdisciplinary art from Sierra Nevada University. She is living and working in Berkeley, California, 
and will soon potentially be moving to the Mojave Desert. This is the fourth, you win, Mary J's. This is her fourth time participating in the Wonder Women Residency. I'm so pleased to welcome Mary J's. Thank you, Doris. And thanks for everybody being here, um, especially the SNU folks I can see. Um, I so appreciate you being here um, and everyone else, even if I don't know you, thanks for coming. Um, so what you're gonna see in a few seconds is a presentation an improvisation and a finished work. It's a method I've been experimenting with since remote cultural presentations like this one became the norm. So please enjoy. Hi. <laughs> This is a pre-recorded performance. It's a slideshow of my experiences from walking in a local park. Although I'm live in the recording here, I'm not live with you there. The future of me is live with you now, and we're all alive. But if you're watching this as a recording, you're only live with a document of life in this screen. The hand and the mouse now visible are happening at the same time I'm speaking. I may make mistakes in this presentation. That is because like most of us in the time of the 2020 and ongoing pandemic, I'm a human trying to manage technology and speak about difficult subjects at the same time. Behind me or in front of me is a mental map that I made in watercolor to relate to you. The blue pins correspond to the locations I'm going to share with you today. When we return to this map, some pins will turn orange. That's for the experience that I'll be talking about. Therapeutically Prescribed Walking in Sibley Volcanic Regional Preserve by Mary Jace. Words are very hard to get out. <clears throat> and there's an impulse to code my language that maybe comes from having to manage and then reframe negative thoughts. My moods have been roller coastering. My lows have been pretty low, and I struggle to get up to normal, which is as high as I ever do get. These walks in the park are often when I can reliably, but not always get up from a low. It's the winter between 2020 and 2021, and I have depression. These walks are prescribed by my therapist for two to three times a week. I take these walks as if they were a pharmaceutical pill from a psychiatrist. I used to take an SSRI dose until I developed migraines after sun exposure as a side effect. These walks are the replacement therapy to that prescription. I know when I haven't taken this medicine, not just from the gap in my morning, but from the darkening of my mood. Every hike, I come prepared to record what I see or feel once I've cleared my mood. After improved circulation, I can start seeing beauty, the kind of capital B beauty that makes me grateful for the gift of being able to see it. I bring my tools to practice, slowing down and observing, not blowing past the moment, but really sitting in it. In my backpack, I bring a foldable stool, a bottle of water, and a snack. For observing, I have a sketchbook, a pencil, a water brush, a Sumi ink brush pen, an eraser, a pencil sharpener, a water well, a paper towel, and a small set of watercolor pans that I can replace. I also bring a hair elastic in case my, the wind makes my hair a frustration. Ugh. And I've started bringing a lump of clay to work in three dimensions. The clay is new. Uh, but it seems appropriate to the landscape filled with wet earth and textures I've seen in clay before. I also layer up. I always bring a hat, a puffy jacket, sunglasses, and of course my mask. This mask is printed with a painting I made during the wildfire days when smoke blacked out the sun. 
While I hike around waiting for my mood to shift, I will often listen to text to keep me company and give me focus while my mind is changing. I've been listening to critical art theory. Since I've never found an audiobook in this genre, I've had to convert photos of the book's text into speech using an app on my phone. Sometimes the app has a glitch and the audio will be incomprehensible for a time while I walk. Another 3120 and a separate rail pun prantle red Callie's Kurt, the one one diligral leaf and itty. Usually, I just wait for, my gl- for the glitch to clear, much like my mood, and I'll understand normally again, and I'll just trust that I haven't lost much in the glitch. When I first came to this park, I would come to visit the public labyrinth that's marked on the trail sign here. Now, I tend to find new, unmarked labyrinths. These are just three that I have nice photos of, but by my last count, I've found at least seven rock paths like these and several other rock spirals that seem to disappear and reappear periodically. I've been listening to a book on participatory art while I hike. As I listen to a book text about labyrinths as a form of exhibition challenge, and brief dissections of the group's two attempts to overturn exhibition formats via the labyrinth, Die Welt als Labyrinth, Stedelijk Museum. I was also encountering physical labyrinths in this park. I decided the coincidence was worth sitting down for. I sat here and listened to the text spoken my, by my app's British voice for Claire Bishop's Artificial House. The rabbit hole that this sent me down, artists in the 1960s using the labyrinth as a conceptual construct to challenge museum curators to think about participation, led me to the discovery of this publication called The Situationist Times. I've been interested in The Situationist International, a group of avant-garde artists making work about what I understand as the attention economy. During one rainy day, I found a group of people playing wind instruments inside and around this labyrinth. I thought of them as rain fairies and tried to keep my distance in case the rain really was coming at their calling. Maybe it was a kind of derive, and the participatory nature of their ritual was at once available as contemporary art practice and also as archaic tradition. I meet my friends in the park the dogs who walk, run, and play off-leash. When pandemic first started, my very first ever dog companion got sick and passed away. She had an underlying undiagnosed condition, megaesophagus, which made it hard for her to get food to her stomach. She ended up suffering, and the regurgitating food that stayed in her esophagus led to aspirating pneumonia from which she would not recover. While I work through my grief of losing my dog, this park and its endlessly filled character list of pups gave me a safe way to process my love for all of the good dogs. The park allows for off-leash but under voice control dog walking. These off-leash encounters let me imagine that they were my friends too. Now, some of these dogs really do know me. On the right is one of my closest friends, a golden Labrador that I have seen nearly twice a week for months now. At the time of shelter in place orders, this was a big deal for me socially. Any social physical contact, even with non-humans, and especially with social animals like dogs, gave me a sense of being in friendship during a time when I couldn't be with my friends in person. There are a few regular sites in the park that I think of when I begin my journey. When I came across a set of rocks at the top of a ridge, I saw a game of scale and set my camera to try and monumentalize these embedded rocks into the height of mountains by putting them into the faraway horizon line. Since that visit, 
I've been compelled by this place and returned for more creative observation. One time, I wrapped the rock in paper, seen at the right. I worked on a rainy day and used a nearby puddle to fill my sponge with water and to shape this paper around the surface of the rock. I imagine this paper having an intimate relationship with this rock, both in contact and in sharing an experience of wetness. There's a special relationship paper has to water, able to get wet and retain its integrity and strength. Here are some other moments of paper and water, this time with color in the water. I painted the rocks and the surrounding view in my sketchbook. Another regularly visited location for my visits is further into the park. It's in a valley. The first time I came across this place, I wanted it to keep its mysteries, but I was compelled to keep returning. The text from the small sign visible in the center of the image on the left reads, Nine, see hard lava to the right and left, and soft. Easily erode a tuff between, all tilted eastward almost to vertical. The lava to the left baked the top of the tuff's brick red. This lava looks as if it was probably 100 to 150 feet thick. These flows were not fluid, but contained enough silica to be more viscous. They probably moved at a slow walk with glowing blocks of lava tumbling down a steep front and setting vegetation on fire. I also tried to sculpt this place in clay. The challenge was that the earth was so overwhelmingly large and my hands and the clay were too comically small by comparison. I managed to paint these from a respectful distance, but still, the place is an experience greater than my individual capacity. Most of what makes this park remarkable is the visible geological features, especially the volcanic history. This wouldn't be available for observing if this place hadn't once been a quarry for rocks. Many of the labyrinths sit at the bottom of these quarries. And although I visit this park for an experience of nature, I'm also learning the ways in which we are only capable of understanding nature through working with one another to imagine what it can represent. At the top of the red shape in the middle of the sketch is where the rock formation is. The volcano is around the red shape to the left. Of course, it's impossible to show everything in one image, but that doesn't keep me from trying anyway. Once it was pointed out to me that my sketches don't have people in them, then I realized I'm not able to document things that are moving at a certain pace. That is, moving at all. I'm also very aware that we can't interact with one another while we worry about the possibility of passing a virus between us. This has made me learn to keep my distance both physically and psychically from other people. But at the end of the winter in 2021, things started to shift. I often think of rocks as characters, and when I sat down to the trail to observe this one, I became a character myself to other people hiking by. One hiker came by and told me that she also comes out here to paint. I had taken this photo of her a few days before, so I was happy to be meeting her. She asked me which colors I was using for the purple and the lupines, and she said they were hard to get right. I agreed. Purples are challenging, and I shared that even simple sunlight changes like a cloud or a foggy day could change any quality of color. Once I've experienced mysteries, wonders, and greetings in this park, I will always be pulled back to my life by the computer screen, back to the surveillance community of Zoom, forced to connect my meaning through the limitations of internet, service, and file size, and screen fatigue. On the way back, I witnessed fractures. I was reminded of this image when I read Rebecca Solnit's opening essay in Wanderlust. With every winter's rain, more and more red earth and road surface crumbled away, sliding into a heap at the ruinous bottom of the steep slope the road had once cut across. 
I continue to return to the park in the spring and the summer, and I'm noticing more and more change. After so much time using the place as a ritual mood cleanser, I can see it becoming again the place it was before pandemic, but with a renewed sense of connectivity between visitors and an enthusiasm for sharing time and space with rocks and plants and animals and people away from the screen. Thanks, that's it. Thank you, Mary. So uh, just a reminder to put any questions you have for Christy or Mary in the chat. I have a few that I can start with. Um, and I wanted to read some of our comments as well. Um, to Christy um, in speaking about the connection of making and teaching. Um, and I, I wanted to extend that as well to Mary. And in Mary, one of the main threads in the, in the commentary in the chat was about um, pace, time. Um, Jazz Graf says, I'm so aware of the pacing of talk, think, walk, time. I thought that was really beautiful. Um, Hashem says, interesting community aspects. Feels like the, present, the presentation of journey through this artwork is its own form of art story content that feels very meditative. Um, Vanessa Cowdery says, such a wonderful experience, Mary. Thank you for sharing. Elaine Hollyhen says, I caught myself forgetting that you weren't presenting live. Um, I also wanted to speak to that a bit as well. Um, there is something so uh, sort of like visceral and nostalgic about some of the tech that you use in the performance aspect. Um, and then you kind of blend it, of course, with the with, with the fact that we're all sitting here in a digital space on yet another screen, another box. Um, and, uh, and so I guess I'll start there and then uh, go back to the teaching question. Um, for Mary, do you find that in creating the performance um, that that is, that the, the work is the performance or does the work come somewhere before the performance. There's this wonderful kind of like play that you're creating with where's the artist talk? Where's the artwork? Uh, where are you? You know, which one of you is presenting? And I wondered if you could frame that a little bit for us in the context maybe of the residency and, and even your MFA work, since we're talking about learning and the university you're currently um, studying, even though you have yeah. taught and, and worked in administration of other university programs for a long time, uh, you're currently in an MFA program. So if you could speak a bit to that, that yeah. experience. I definitely am an older MFA student. Shout out to the returning MFAs. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of the performance, um, this work, uh, I was making, this was the first thing I was sort of making was um, trying to figure out how to talk about the work. Even in our residency meetings, I had early versions of what I presented here tonight um, as what I presented in our meetings. Um, so there's something about the performance um, that is coming out specifically because uh, we're kind of all performing now in front of our cameras. And that felt really important to me to point to that, um, you know, in, in most sort of like cultural moments like this, the artist does speak a bit, but mostly the work speaks. Um, and so I wanted the work to speak again, but make it about the performance. Um, so that if that makes sense, that's sort of like where the performance is coming from. And then I also um, just wanted to have fun 
um, and also had to have this ritual of uh, going out into the park, uh, going out at all. Because <laughs> for a while there, it would have been very easy for me to just stay inside. Well, not easy, but um, less resistance inside than going outside. Um, so it seemed like it was the it was the thing I was pushing myself to do. And so there was a kind of performance of that as well, you know, that we're always on screen and then we go outside and there's still this hangover, um, I don't know what to call it, watcher um, mm -hmm. with you all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think because we're in front of our cameras a lot more now, I think we're all familiar with a watcher. Um, and I think for those of us, like Christy has spoken about uh, an inner critic, I think for those of us with a very powerful, strong inner critic that we're working with, that's um, that's like normal. <laughs> There's always a watcher. There's always someone who's saying something to you and you have to work at, at speaking back to them. I don't know if that answers um, everything you asked, but. Yeah, and I, it actually helps um, my question for Christy, one of, um, there's, uh, there's this, you know, for me, there's an obvious connection, um, in your presentations today about the, the sort of the culture of the zoom that we live in now, like Christy, you, you know, you, you were able to sort of articulate at length that difficult process of taking something that happens, you know, quite organically in life in a room and putting it into a space that we're not unfamiliar with, but we weren't familiar with it to the extent to which we had to create that familiarity and to sort of innovate this new way of teaching and a new way of learning uh, and socializing and everything, right? And so I wonder, Christy, if you wanted to speak to um, not only uh, maybe how you uh, thought about teaching sculpture making or teaching any kind of making as a, a way for you to source the content of your own work, right? Because you were kind of making work about mm -hmm. the inability to teach how to make work, mm -hmm. uh, which already feels like a lot of layers, <laughs> uh, just like Mary's, you know, feels like so many layers. Um, and so how did you kind of tr try to undo those layers so that you could come up with sort of this, you know, uh, plan? for the for the project right that the project was you collecting these stories from people that were happening to you kind of in real time i'm thinking about the yeah. snow story the for, sort of the first yeah. break you know these real life stories became what you were bringing to the zoom residency and then making f you wanted it to definitely be a physical object so can you speak to that a little bit yeah um so i guess the first time i realized how i learned and teach was actually Dr. Gravity. I don't know if he's still at NJCU. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> he Wait. was like, maybe you just learn best by teaching it. And that's when it occurred to me that I was like, oh yeah, because I have to like really process what it is I'm doing and then tell someone else how to do it and then hear myself say it. And then it really like processes. Um, and coming up with an idea out of thin air has always, I don't know, I felt like it's kind of like, felt wasteful to just make for like the art for art's sake with clay just kind of feels a little wasteful, at least for me in this era. Um, and thinking of making for others felt more like giving back. So back coming back to gratitude was like a way of changing my mindset from that inner critic. And instead of complaining about all the things that I'm not doing well enough or could do or shoulda, woulda, coulda, uh, instead of that, I changed the narrative to all the things that um, I am grateful for. And so the experience with the snow, getting snowed in was kind of that catalyst into thinking outside of myself and more um, at, to others and how I can um, give back and I realized also in the residency and talking about all these stories um, in the past, I have given away a lot of my clay. I didn't have all the clay that I did end up making in college that I was like, oh, cool. I, I like how I did this. I liked it so much. I gave it to people I cared about. And then, um, you know, people come and go. And so they still have it or they don't. 
and um, and I don't have it. And so that that attachment, you know, getting attached to your creations is also, I guess, why I liked this this gift idea because I don't want more attachments. I want to let go more and just be free and like let things come and go and people that I just met get a gift and people I've known all along get a gift. And um, yeah, and so that I felt kind of like freeing and the tangibility of clay is, is so different than like graphite and paint. It's just very much, I feel like I have control even when I don't have control. Um, Jazz has two comments I'd like to read that speak to uh, what you were just discussing. <laughs> She says she has she has lots of things. Please please feel like you can go back and read this chat. Um, it will be archived. Many instructors are often looking to teaching as a way to access facilities, but also that passing the torch to future generations of artists and art appreciators is essential for us all to thrive and change the stigma of being of even being an artist uh, and being valued in society. But she also speaks about the ceramic portion teaching is a form of giving right as as you're speaking about gratitude and giving things um, I think that was clear and not an indication that one cannot do but that one is willing to share what they what the path that they have already gone through so that someone else might already be set up a bit further along right um, and so lots of lots of sort of uh, you know sort of comments about um, the giving aspects as well. And uh, Alicia Wright says, it's wonderful that you've made so many gifts to express your gratitude through your art. Um, and then also Jazz Graf says, this is the one I was thinking of, these vessels may be seemingly mundane, right? Or regarded as a lowbrow type of art, something that we might feel is ubiquitous in our home. But I have to say as a receiver of some of these pieces from makers, they hold great meaning. When these cups are embraced by my palms as I imbibe warm, calming liquid, the daily practice of taking things in, these vessels hold things that we fill ourselves with that hold essential things. Oh. I thought that was important for you to hear. Um, the, uh, another thing I wanted to ask both of you, um, obviously the, the things that you have made, I was gonna say objects, but the, the work that you have made, whether it's an object or another kind of experience, um, you know, does feel sort of complex. But one thing I think that feels more concrete is um, in both of your work is sort of this, uh, this experience of landscape. And in, Mary, obviously you took us on a journey and we had a map and it was a bit more clear, but Christy, you also spoke about this moment where when you traveled and were able to be in this expansive landscape, things became more clear for the project and you were able to kind of really like solidify the direction of the project and how it would kind of ultimately take its final form or is taking its final form. Right. It's still in process, obviously. Well, yeah. um, so I guess my question is about um, the natural landscape and in visiting this landscape and, and maybe they're even kind of similar landscapes because you traveled west Right. Christy, uh, you know, where, where Mary has been, uh, you know, uh, traveling or, or visiting, living, because it's right next door visiting. Um, that landscape has inspired art, obviously, for, for a very long time, and we can imagine um, those examples in history. But can you speak more to how these places and these landscapes in particular connect to the theme of health? because I felt like there was, both of you mentioned how these were connected to your health journey, your mental health journey. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about how that translates into art. Um, I'll, I'll speak. Um, so getting out of the house, one was huge for mental health. So getting, being in nature is all of course huge, um, but we, specifically picked Arizona because we figured we'd be away from people. So social distancing would, would be a little easier, um, at least hiking and, and, you know, we're not going to Cancun for spring break. It was like the desert. Um, so being around uh, like surreal, huge canyons and how deep it went, it just kind of made me feel so small 
and all my problems feel like really that's what you want to stress about for a week or so everything just felt so small when you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon going like wow this has been here for a, for a really long time and it took so long to make this and here I am standing at it you know complaining about whatever um so at least the landscape of the Grand Canyon and of Sedona and being in California and just living and moving. And uh, the weather was also great. The sun was always out. So that vitamin D was great. Um, I guess it gave me like ah, relief. Like here, I don't have to be like the biggest thing in my head. Everything else can kind of be bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I resonate with that, Christy, the notion that um, the sense of scale is um, so important when we go outside of our homes and, and indoors. We have a new sense of scale. We have a new sense of our relationship um, to our problems, to each other, and to where we are on the planet. So I agree with that. I've been doing research on really what we mean by landscapes and what nature is um, and how we relate to it as part of nature or apart from nature. And um, um, I, I think there's something in, the, in what we do when we go outside, especially when we go outside to a park that is um, designated for us to go to, uh, that we're doing some kind of um, imagining of what nature does for us and is for one another. So I think we're sort of like participating in a social ritual um, when we go to parks. Um, and I think that's part of the health of the park is that we're experiencing it with other people. We know it's a thing that we do. It's not exactly the same as like um, an older version of wilderness where this was wild or frightening or a place that we needed to um, keep apart from. Um, so I think there is a social quality to going to parks. Um, and then in terms of like direct health um, benefits, um, I had been, I've also been doing research like Christy said about vitamin D on the skin. There's also um, something that my, doctor told me about that I should be taking my sunglasses off, that the UV light, all the all of the spectrum light should be hitting our eyes, um, that that also has a cognitive uh, shift for us and a health shift for us. So I'm very like aware that once I get to the park, I take my sunglasses off because they're really not for, um, they're really for driving at this point for me. Um, and I, I, prefer to see also because I'm painting I want to see the full spectrum of light um, on the work and outside but apparently there's a health benefit to that as well so I realized that we should start wrapping up and I wanted to ask one more question that's in the chat and read uh, one of our last comments um, Alicia Wright says the performance was very real like that you chose to leave in the moments where you made errors in your speech not trying to be perfect as you talked very authentically about your experiences and changing your mood. Um, sorry, Eileen has a similar comment and a question. I also wanted, to, which I'll end with, um, Hashem um, says learning by teaching, that's a good thought. I think that's something we could certainly come away with today. Um, Christy, your story resonates so very much. Thank you, Vanessa Cowdery says as well. Jasmine Graff makes a comment about um, how interesting that you speak about burying this infectious phrase or burying some of these uh, um, dismissive sort of uh, ways that, that, that uh, teaching can be discussed. Um, and yet you're working with clay and speaking about you know, earth in this way, the flesh of the earth, she calls it an act of transforming the unearthed material, the shape shifting involved in that. I thought that was quite beautiful. And then um, Eileen asks you, Mary, I wonder if the narrative style, Eileen Farrar asks, um, I wonder if the narrative style is natural to you um, or is there lots of trial and error in forming the perfect sounds and styles? 
<laughs> that's, that's a good question. Like unveil the cloak. <laughs> it is a good question. It's um, it's definitely a trial and error, but it's also a lot of um, I think uh, Sharon saying something is about a gift to ourselves. I also, you know, related to a gift is permission to um, make mistakes, permission to um, be yourself and not be perfect or expect a perfect close. Um, but I did rehearse a lot, a lot, a lot this piece. Mm -hmm. And the more I rehearsed, the more things came uncovered, the more things kind of unwound. Um, so I think it's a, it's a comp, that's why I say it's sort of like an improvisation uh, because it's every time is a new sort of live performance for me and like live performance things happen and you just keep moving forward and that's like life as well you know um yeah I'm, I'll read Sharon's question um I wanted to ask if, if you thought that your artwork and or the process as a gift and maybe Christy you can answer that and you can be mm. our last Sure. Yeah. I was, I was remind, remembering also when, when Steph was saying that. So I, that's why I said it's definitely yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Making time on Sundays to be on a zoom with other artists and be creative and touch stuff and not have to deal with anything else. Just carving away that space and time for me, especially when I would advocate and do work, uh, like work, look, just mm -hmm. I don't want to work on a Sunday. I want to think about me on a Sunday. So yeah, it was like definitely a gift to myself to be able to finally make and be com comfortable with whatever I make. Yeah. Marlene is also calling it a necessity. So we can also make that distinction. A gift that is necessary, right? Well, they do say the present is a gift. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters today. And thank you for all of you that are um, still here um, listening um, and commenting and participating in this event today. Um, it has been quite a journey. The Wonder Women uh, residency will be wrapping up um, at the beginning of the fall and the exhibition will be uh, in the Visual Arts Gallery at NJCU beginning at the end of October. Um, and so come back again and revisit this work in, uh, in space, in real space. Um, I wanted to thank um, Stephanie Chaikin and I think I'll hand it over to her and her incredible team at the Center for the Arts. Please stay tuned to them as well for the programming that will becoming you know, more and more in real life uh, spaces potentially. And so stay abreast of our events, which I think Stephanie will be telling you more about. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Doris. What a beautiful, beautiful program. Mary, Avni, Stephanie, Christy, you knocked it out of the park. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely. I want to thank our Center for the Arts team, Anna Carhart, our theater manager, Sabrina Sabalo, our box office manager and Zoom coordinator, and Jamie Mayer, our operations associate, for, again, knocking it out of the park. Uh, we have two upcoming programs that I hope you'll join us for. Uh, on Saturday, we have a beautiful program from Mexico Beyond Mariachi called Agua Es Vida. Water is Life, it'll be um, stream, live streamed um, at 12 noon. And then coming up in person um, in the Margaret Williams Theater on the 20th of June, uh, the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra Chamber Players Trio performing The Jungle Book. So it's Father's Day, bring the whole family. Um, nice way to spend the afternoon before you take dad out to dinner. And um, Doris, you can tell us about the upcoming shows. Yes. Um, and so in our visual arts gallery um, in September, the very beginning uh, of the 
fall semester, we'll have a group exhibition curated by Eileen Farrar, who's here today. Thank you, Eileen, for being here. Um, and so you can see here, it's opening uh, September 2nd with an artist reception on September 10th. Um, and then um, another event we have is the solo exhibition of work by Amanda Thackeray called Surface Tension. That'll be in the Harold B. Lemmerman Gallery uh, beginning September 3rd. And we'll also have an artist reception September 10th. You can, of course, get all of the details for visiting and for reception information um, on the uh, NJCU Visual Arts Galleries page, which I'll throw into the chat as well for all of you. Um, and then, of course, the Wonder Woman exhibition, which we've been touting and giving you so much information about today, Health and Art in a Global Pandemic, um, which also includes Polly Barden, myself, Christine De Cruz, Sharon Lee De La Cruz, who we heard from, as well as Christine, uh, and the artists that you saw today, Mary J's, Christy Lopez, Avni, um, Palkiwala, Stephanie Tishner, Agnes Sharkovska, and uh, Melissa McAlpin as well. So all 10 artists will have work in the gallery um, starting at the end of October through December. I also want to say that anyone that has ideas of upcoming, that, of things that they'd like us to bring in for upcoming events, please send it our way. Um, we, you're our family. And visit us at njcu.edu slash arts to register for upcoming events. So I hope you have an amazing afternoon. We're all inspired and um, you've, you've lit us up. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone. Please stay in touch. See you in the real world soon, I hope.